going today. I love it. Strong voices. Fantastic. Well, welcome to you here today. Welcome to you online to Faith Centennial United Church, where Jesus Christ is Lord. I was unexpectedly away last week, so I just want to say I'm really grateful for Sue and Matthew, who's not here today, for filling in for me. It's so great to have awesome, wonderful, talented folks to fill in when you need it. Um, so I'm just uh, very grateful for that. Thank you so much for filling in and taking over. Um, I do also, uh, so we had a garage sale. I don't know if any of you knew, but we had a garage sale yesterday. Um, and, and so something came by way of the garage sale. And, uh, oh, it's, it's this. It, someone's laughing because I think they know what it is, right? And so someone was there, and, and Chris nabbed it for me. So I have to put it on today. I'm going to be wearing my angel wings today. Because we're talking about <laughs> angels. Uh, so I got my angel wings on for church today. <laughs> So thanks, Chris, for snagging that. She saw it. She's like, that's perfect for angels, right? So uh, I'm really happy to be wearing my angel. Maybe we'll wear it for the rest of the angel series. I'll just put it on every Sunday, and uh, it'll be good. So, yeah, welcome to you here today. Uh, we're gonna... I was hoping with the mask nobody would recognize me, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, it takes much more than that to disappear in here. <laughs> okay, our responsive psalm is uh, 103. Uh, verses 1 to 10. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his Who forgives all sins and heals all your diseases. Who satisfies your desires with good things, so your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord He will not always accuse nor will he harbor his anger forever. And the second reading is from Acts chapter 10, verses 3 through 8. One day about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is said to be with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who had spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants, and a devoted soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. The third reading is from Isaiah, chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You may have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the highest, utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. This is the living word of God. Thanks. Let's come together in prayer. Mighty God, we thank you for your holy scriptures. We do not know what we would do without them. They are a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And when we forget them, we forget you. O oh God, this is your revelation of who you are, of your directives to your church and your people. It behooves us to study them, to dig deep, and to find out what you are saying to us. So help us today, O oh God. We want to hear the Holy Spirit. 
We're trusting, we're praying in the Spirit, and we ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would illumine these pages, that it fill the words of the preacher and the listener alike, and that we may know that today we have met with the living God. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to say three layers, getting a little warm, but that's all right. It's the, it's the hot seat up here, right? So... So the last week that I was here, not last week necessarily because I wasn't here, but the week before that, we started our deep dive into angels. And of course, our big word today is angelology, which is the study of angels. So we, we dove into our study of angelology to really dig deep into the truth about angels from our scriptures. We started this by looking at what our current culture, what the world outside these walls has twisted angels into over the years and the roots of that movement and those actions and then, of course, we dispelled some of the popular angel myths out there. We learned a very important truth, one that is often misconstrued in our faith, that the angel of the Lord is not, in fact, Jesus, because Jesus was not a created being, but angels are. And this is important, so that we do not conflate everything in the First Testament with Jesus, for one, which is a grave sin to do and on our part, but more importantly, uh, to make him out to be an angel would be to diminish Jesus as God's son and our savior. Uh, so for no angel could ever pay the price of sin as Jesus has done so completely. So we press onward in our mission to, uh, throughout, to cut through those lies, to cut through all that, and cut through the misconceptions about angels this week. And uh, we're going to look into how our culture is uh, portraying them a little bit more. Namely, we're going to look at that idea of the cute and cuddly angel this week. Uh, we see carved into porcelain in pictures, right? So angels were not really created to be cute and cuddly. They were not created to be uh, lovely, snuggly things. Angels were created to be fearsome, to be awesome. They were and are messengers. They exist to serve God. They are not squishmallows. They're not cuddle toys. They're not comfort pillows. They're not blankets for us to snuggle into when we feel blue. We remember our psalm from last week, uh, Psalm 148, verses 2 to 5, says, Praise him. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. So I'm going to break a couple of hearts here. I know it. I know I'm going to. My office is open for counseling, so feel free to come in. Okay, I've got office hours coming up, so feel free to come in. But angels are not cosmic caseworkers, looking at you, touched by an angel. And they're not parental figure, figures, not winged parental figures, looking to keep us away from our own stupidity, like when we stick our finger in the socket, okay? Let's, let's put that to the side for now. Again, if you need counseling, if you need to talk about that, come see me in my office. They were crafted for th something. They're crafted by God for God. He commands them. He issues their orders, he governs them, he speaks to them, and they speak on behalf of God and act only when commanded to by God. So that is something very important that we need to know. It's important because it puts angels in their proper context. They aren't just sitting around waiting for us to act up or need help and jump in before we screw ourselves up, right? They're not just sitting there on the, on the waiting seat, right, ready for us. If that were true, if that were the case, every time you scrape your knee, every time you, you fell off your bike, or if you got into a car accident, or some financial ruin fell upon you, you'd be asking yourself, well, where's my guardian angel? What's he doing, right? And, and we can't rightly ask that. So, you know, if, if they were waiting on us to, to make a mistake and, they, and, and the mistake happened, then where's our guardian angel, right? So Acts 10, which we heard this morning, we heard Rodney uh, loud and clear, tells the story of Cornelius coming to deliver instructions to Peter through the instructions delivered to him through the angel. Daniel was visited by an angel through uh, and lived through a night living in the de uh, lion's den where the angel held the, the hungry lion's mouth shut, right? And as I'm sure you're going to remember, as I say it here, we heard it pretty well, Advent, we, we sung a little bit of it this morning, during Advent, an angel comes and announces the Savior's birth to the shepherds in the field. We are reminded of this from our hymn that we sung a few minutes ago from that classic verse in Luke 2, verse 9. It says, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Why are they afraid, you might ask? 
Well, I mean, if you remember this, one of the first things that the angel says to everyone that they show up to, right, including the shepherds there in, in Luke 2, it says, do not be afraid, right? The angel shows up and says, do not be afraid. But they are afraid because angels are fearsome sights. Not only do they appear very suddenly, like all of a sudden you're just looking around and poof, right there is an angel, right? Like out of nowhere, they just show up. But like that's something in and of itself. But, and so they appear to Mary and the shepherds in the field, right? So they appear to people in the fields. But they're possibly floating and flying at the same time, not something humans regularly do, right? And they usually have some kind of massive presence about them, right? And in our Advent passage from Luke, for example, Scripture tells us that the glory of the Lord shone around the angel. So this one specifically is glowing with something, right? And that's pretty fearsome. That's pretty awesome. When was the last time you saw a human-like figure just poof in existence before you, flying or floating, and this glorious light shining around it, right? And you're just like, yeah, whatever. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. Who cares, right? Like, that doesn't happen, right? So it, it produces a little bit of fear in you. It produces a little bit of that awe, that reverence, right? Psalm 103, verse uh, 20 tells us, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heed the voice of his word. Angels are strong. They're strong. They excel in strength even, as Scripture says. I mean, who of us here, who of us here could hold shut the mouth of a hungry lion? Dawn, do not put up your hand. <laughs> Any of us? And, no, that's right. None of us can, right? Hungry lions are powerful beasts, but the angel just does it, right? Just like it makes it seem like a cakewalk, right? That's great. That's fearsome. How many of us fly with wings of our own? I mean, I got wings on me. I'm not floating, right? Not happening, right? This is part and parcel of why angels are fearsome. They've done mighty deeds. Jesus himself tells us there are legions of angels even. Legions. Legions which he could at any moment call down to help him. Just, they're just waiting on his call. Now for reference, we often say that Jesus was using terms that they would understand back in their day. So he's using the term uh, legion to refer to like a Roman legion, right? The army, right? And so perhaps he had his own definition, but maybe he's talking about, you know, what the Romans were putting down. But let's assume like a Roman military legion that he was referencing. And there's, there's some disagreement over how big a legion was. Some say 3,000, some say 12. So we're going to conservatively take the middle ground here. We're going to say 6,000. 6,000 angels in a legion, right? Or 6,000 Roman soldiers made up a legion. And so when we read in Matthew's gospel that says, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? All right, we're going to do our angel math this morning. Okay, so we got one Roman legion equals 6,000 troops, right? We got Jesus could call 12 at least. So that's, that's 72,000 angels that Jesus could be like, all right, dad, come on, bring them down. And then poof. They all just show up, right? Like, that is amazing. It's awesome. It's fearsome. Absolutely. These are armies, armies of angels, hordes of angels. In fact, Hebrews 12, 22 tells us this about the number. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. There's so many of them that we cannot even put a number to them. Have you ever seen an innumerable amount of anything? Like, have you ever seen an innumerable amount of eggs or ants or emus or anything? No, we haven't. We don't know what that looks like, right? Because you can't even think about it. The earth would be full. There'd be no room to move. There'd be no standing room, right? It's absolutely incredible. And we don't call something that big, that, uh, uh, the amount of that cute or cuddly, do we? We don't do that. And we call it fearsome. We call it awesome. We call it beyond comprehension. We tend to think angels are like no big deal. They're just often soft and cute more than anything. And like a little plush toy you get at McDonald's after finishing your Happy Meal, right? That's... But in reality, people saw these beings and they were shocked. They were afraid and stunned. Scripture records the reactions of people like Mary and the shepherds for a reason. It's so that we never lose reverence for what God has made fearsome and awesome. There's one specific angel I do want to touch on this morning, though, uh, before we wrap up, 
Next week, we're going to be talking about all different kinds of angels, what they do, what they look like. It's going to be really neat, weird and neat and cool, so do come out for that. But this morning, I want to talk, touch on one in particular. Anyone here ever read Paradise Lost by, by John Milton? Anyone? No? Okay, preaching to a new audience on that one. Okay, cool. It's all right. Um, so before I went into seminary, back in 2015, I took an English literature course at Brock University, and I wrote three of my four essays for that course on this book alone. It's called Paradise Lost by John Milton. And so uh, there is one angel that scripture describes who was created far more beautiful than the rest. I know you're, you're starting to clue into this to who it is. Uh, he was the more son of the morning uh, from Isaiah 14, uh, verse 12, described as lovely and beautiful. This, of course, was Lucifer. And Milton's work, Milton's book, Paradise Lost, does a wonderful job of showcasing Lucifer and his fall with far more detail than scripture gives us. Now, let's be clear. It's not scripture. Okay, so let's be clear. But it's a very interesting read, and it sheds a lot of light on what scripture gives us, gets a little more detail uh, about this fallen angel. And from my research, the book actually stays very close to scripture, doesn't infer a whole lot, kind of like today's culture, that the movies infer a whole lot, they put their own spin on it. And when writing those essays for the course back in 2015, I used scripture as my backbone, I used scripture as my resource for that, uh, so that I wouldn't be lost in any of the inference. However, anyhow, John Milton and our very own prophet Isaiah confirmed that Lucifer counted himself equal to or above God. Lucifer wished to rule with God. He wanted to be right up there, right beside God. And Isaiah puts it this way. He says, for you have said in your heart, this is, he's talking about Lucifer, you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the far sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Lucifer overreached. Milton agrees with scripture that Lucifer led a third of the angels in heaven in a rebellion against God and the heavenly host. A holy war, if you will, broke out in the heavens and God tore the rebellion asunder. In Paradise Lost, Milton gives us an account of Lucifer's perspective from the loss of the war that he waged. While God is triumphant, having beaten the rebellion and quashed it into hell, Lucifer actually believes that he has won. He tries to flip the script. His take on the loss is that while he wanted to rule in heaven, barring that, he will take ruling in hell just the same. Either way, he gets to rule something. However, Lucifer and his hosts are no longer beautiful beings of light and power and grace, but are now scarred, marred, charred, and deformed. Their wings are no more, their faces are twisted, and tormented versions of their previous glory. They have been stripped of what made them holy and fearsome. They're now horrific and morbid. And so Milton, with scripture, exposes to us Lucifer's true nature. Deceiver, liar. And this is where Lucifer's fate intertwines with our own fate, for it was Lucifer who tempts Eve, right? With the fruit from the tree. It is Lucifer that, depending on your particular bent, causes either indirectly or directly the fall of man into sin, just as Lucifer himself fell from heaven's grace. And while none of this is said to cause you any fear, because Jesus has already conquered the enemy and conquered sin, it does make us realize just how fearsome angels are, because it was one, one singular angel who started a holy war with a third of all the angels. And it was that same singular fallen angel who dragged humanity away from Eden through deception. If one angel can do that, if think of what two could do, or a legion, 6,000, or 12 legions, 72,000. They are certainly not your cute, cuddly, variety brand angel, are they? Amen. You are all ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through you. Let all you do be done in love. Amen.
Creation. 